What's up, duelists? It's your boy. We're back. We're back with another video. This video is actually going to be pretty sick if you're looking to get into Yu-Gi-Oh! in the year 2022, or honestly, after that as well. This is a video I wish kind of existed when I was getting back into current Yu-Gi-Oh! I'm more of an old school quote unquote player. I quit playing in 2012 and I wanted to get back into the game largely for content reasons, but also because it looked like a lot of fun. This video is going to be the only 20 cards I think you really need to know in order to play modern Yu-Gi-Oh. There's kind of this cool phenomenon where even though there's like tens of thousands of cards printed or whatnot, there's still only like <laughs> 20 or 30 cards that are just better than the rest of them. And this video is going to go over them and their applications. I'm also going to talk about, I think, the top 15 archetypes right now in Yu-Gi-Oh that I think if you know these 15 archetypes, you can go to a tournament, you can do a reasonable job. I mean, I've been playing at my locals the last few weeks and going all right, like going positive in record, just knowing these 20 cards and these 15 archetypes. Anyway, let's just go ahead and get right into things. If you aren't already subscribed, make sure and subscribe right now. Just just do it. Just do it. Honestly, help me out a lot. I want to hit 5k by June. I want to hit 10k by the end of the year. I don't know if it's possible, but I would love to see it. I would love to see it. All right, first card. First card is Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring. This little dude, this little this little lad. This is part of a cycle of cards that are like ghost girls. They're like zombie tuners, level three. They have zero attack usually, and then they have a modal effect. Their modal effect is you can discard this card and negate stuff. And what the things you can negate are, are listed on the card. For Ash Blossom, it's specifically, if your opponent searches a card, special summons a card from the deck, or sends a card from the deck to the graveyard. Each one of these ghost girls can only be used once per turn, which is a pretty big downside, if I'm going to be honest. If you draw multiple of them, you're kind of, you know, drawing dead, basically. But they are very important cards to know. They can interact on the first turn of the game if your opponent's going first. They help shut off your opponent's broken strategies. A few of the other ones are, I guess, Ghost Bell is pretty popular right now. And I think the Ghost Ogre is another one that's pretty popular. And I don't know. There's a few other ones like whatever, Spring, Joyous Spring, something or other. What is it? Not Joyous Spring. There, what is the one that's like Moonlit something? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. But basically, I'm going to count them all as one card. This is, uh, this is the Ghost Girl cycle. You gotta know what these cards do in order to play modern Yu-Gi-Oh. They're pretty much bread and butter hand traps. They're, you know, solid cards if you want to include them in your deck. If you need a little filler, you need a little interaction. Can't go wrong with the Ghost Girls. Alright, second card that you need to know to play modern Yu-Gi-Oh is Fairy Tale Snow. This card is recently unbanned. It's limited to one, but really one is all you need. If this card is normal summoned or special summoned, you can target one face-up monster your opponent controls, change it to face-down defense position. So it has a Book of Moon on the summon, and then the important part is if this card is in your graveyard, quick effect, you can banish seven other cards from your hand field and or graveyard to special summon this card. So it's a card that can sit around in your graveyard, and I'm going to get into why this card is so powerful later on, but you can you can bring it out as like an interaction, as a Book of Moon. You, you can do it multiple times per turn. It's very good at decks that load up their graveyard with lots of effects like Dragon Link or Despia. It's very good at decks that can put it into the graveyard very easily like Thunder Dragon. Um, uh, did I say against decks? I meant, I meant with, in deck. You get what I'm saying. You get what I'm saying. It's a very powerful card and the stats actually aren't that bad either. 1850 gets over a lot of the common starters in the format like Alubear and Mo Yi. And it's just, it's just a solid card. Being a light is a good thing. You know, all around great card. Interrupt that you can summon out from the graveyard, extender to some degree if your deck has generic links. Just something that I think you should know about, know about the interactions with this card if you're going to play modern Yu-Gi-Oh. It's also a really cool way to dodge skill drain. If you're playing up against Eldritch and they have skill drain, you can summon a monster, activate that monster's effect, banish it for the cost for Fairy Tail Snow, and then you dodge skill drain, Veiler, Imperm, that kind of stuff. Anyway, Anyway, moving on, moving on. Powerful card, definitely need to know it. Number three. Number three is Artifact Lancia. This is one of two of the Artifact monsters I think you need to know. I'm going to go ahead and put number four up here too, which is Artifact Scythe. The Artifact monsters are very interesting. If you're just getting back into Yu-Gi-Oh! or getting into Yu-Gi-Oh! in general, they kind of break the rules of the game in that you can set them from your hand 
into the spell and trap zone as a spell. Normally when this is done in the past, it's, you know, been cheating because people are setting their infernity beetles or whatnot to downsize their hand, but this is actually part of the card's effect, which is pretty cool. If this card is destroyed by a card effect, you can special summon it, which is the other part of the artifact card effects, which makes them very interesting. They are kind of like these interesting cards you can set in your spell trap zone if your opponent pops it, trying to play through your back row, all of a sudden you get this powerful interrupt. But that's usually not the way it's used. Usually you're blowing it up yourself. Usually you're using their other effects in degenerate, unfair ways. And these two in particular, Lancia and Scythe, both have very unfair effects. Lancia has an effect where you can tribute this card from your hand or face of field. Neither player can banish cards for the rest of this turn. So since you can tribute it from your hand, it's more or less a hand trap, which is very powerful. It stops any sort of banishing for an entire turn, which is also very powerful. It interacts very favorably with a lot of cards that are trying to banish your cards or a lot of cards that are trying to banish themselves to set up or start combos. This card is very disgusting. I've seen it completely time lock for players. Very, very powerful. And artifact size effect is when it's special summoned, your opponent cannot special summon monsters from the extra deck for the rest of the turn. This is, honestly, if you're watching this video after the next ban list, this card's probably gonna be banned, but it is very broken. It's very, very powerful. You gotta know about this card. You gotta know what it does, why it exists, how to play around it. You gotta know how it gets set up, that sort of stuff. This is definitely one of the 20 cards you need to know in order to play current format Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay, number five. Number five is a big one. Number five is a big one, big space rock. Nibiru the Primal Being. Nibiru the Primal Being. If you've played old school Yu-Gi-Oh, this guy's kinda like Gors. He's like the Gors of the format. He makes sure your opponent can't just outright do all their degen stuff and kill you. During the main phase, if your opponent normal, sum normal summoned or special summoned five or more monsters this turn, quick effect, you can tribute as many face-up monsters on the field as possible. Important to note, it's only face-up monsters, so if you have a monster set, Nibiru will not tribute it. If you do, special summon this card from your hand, or did I say face-up monster? I said, I meant face-down monster. If you have a set monster, yeah, that's, that's what I meant to say, uh, but yeah. If you do special summon this card from your hand, then special summon one primal being token. The token is the size of all the monsters combined attack and defense that you tributed. Very powerful card. If your opponent starts to go off, starts to pop off with their combo, they summon like 20 cards, you just drop a nib, destroy their whole board, give them a token, which is usually pretty easy to out because it's a vanilla monster, and you get a 3000 light monster for your time. If you're going second, your opponent doesn't even get a chance to use the token in the battle phase, and honestly, they usually don't because you can choose to summon the token in defense position. This is a card that most decks have to play around if they're trying to do degenerate stuff. This is a card that you definitely need to play around if you want to do degenerate stuff. And this is definitely a card you need to know while playing modern Yu-Gi-Oh. All right, number six. Number six is Psy Frame Gear Gamma. There's a whole cycle of these cards, but I think this is the only one you really need to know. This card says it cannot be normal summoned or set, so if you draw it, it can only be special summoned by a card effect. When your opponent activates a monster effect while you control no monsters, you can special summon both this card and one Psyframe Driver, which is a vanilla card, from your hand or deck or graveyard, and if you do, negate that activation, and if you do, destroy that monster. So basically what happens is your opponent will summon a monster, activate the effect, they'll use a monster from their hand, activate the effect, whatever, use a monster in the graveyard, activate the effect. You get the idea. You special summon this guy from your hand. You special summon your one brick, which is the Psyframe Driver, from your graveyard, your hand, your deck, and you negate and destroy that effect. At the end phase, you banish both this guy and the driver. However, if you're able to use this guy on your turn, it gives you two free bodies, which is really, really nice. And this guy's a tuner, and this guy's a non-tuner, so it gives you a free level 8 synchro, which is also very nice on top of having an Omni Negate plus Destruction. Well, it's not an Omni Negate, but... Um, any monster negate, basically. A monster negate plus destruction is, is very powerful for a hand trap. You do need to include Psyframe Driver in your deck if you want to play this card, and Psyframe Driver is a brick. It's just a worse summon skull. That's light. That's pretty much it. It's a bad card. But if you do, you get the upside of having this very powerful hand trap in Psyframe Gear Gamma. One of the most common applications with this card is when you can convert the drawn brick, like Psyframe Gear or Psyframe Driver. With stuff like, you know, Lubellion or Polymerization in the Despia deck, or with Chaos Space in the Dragon Link deck. Gamma is also really, really good when paired with Lancia, because if you activate Gamma on your opponent's turn and negate their monster, 
if you've also activated Artifact Lancia, they won't be banished during the end phase, so you'll basically get to untap, go to your turn with Gamma and Driver still in play. Two free bodies, very, very powerful. Very, very powerful uh, reversal effects. Can't understate the prevalence of this card in the format. Definitely be aware of it when playing Modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay, now we're getting into the spell cards. Now we're getting into the spell cards, and this is the big one. I think this is the big spell card that I think you need to know about if you're playing Modern Yu-Gi-Oh, and it's Forbidden Droplet. This card has a lot of text, and it has a lot of different applications, so I'm just going to try to cover a few of them, try to cover a few of the common ones, but just know that the ceiling for this card is very high. You can do a lot of stuff with this, very, very underrated. This first part of this card says send any number of cards from your hand and or field to the graveyard. So this is the cost. If you can't send cards to the graveyard because you're locked under D-Shift or Macro or whatever, then you can't activate this card. Very important to note. The second part is the effect. Choose that many effect monsters your opponent controls until the end of the turn their attack is halved. Also, their effects are negated. So this is pretty big. This is pretty big. Not only does it have attack points, which means it can be used in the damage step, which opens up a whole wide variety of applications, but also it negates those monsters' effects. That's a very powerful card. It can negate multiple monsters' effects. It's a quick play spell, which is important to note, because when you're activating it and choosing your cost, you can send cards that are in the middle of a chain basically being activated. Let's say you've activated another spell card. We'll get to that in a second, but um, let's say you're activating Monster Reborn, for example. If your opponent activates a monster effect in response, you can chain Forbidden Droplet, send that face up Monster Reborn as a cost, and then negate the monster that they're trying to respond to it with. But the most important part of this card's text is actually the last part of it. It says, in response to this card's activation, your opponent cannot activate cards or the effects of cards with the same original type as the cards you sent to the graveyard to activate this card. And then, of course, you can only activate once per turn, which uh, means the multiples are pretty bad, but not really because you can just send them for cost off the first one. This second part of the effect, it's a little bit confusing the way it's worded, but... It's pretty straightforward once you figure it out. If you activate Droplet and you send a spell card, your opponent cannot respond to it with spell cards. If you activate Droplet and you send a monster card, your opponent cannot respond to it with monster cards. If you activate Droplet and you send a trap card, you get the idea. If you send all three, your opponent cannot respond to this card. Very, very powerful effect. Very, very powerful effect. It's unresponsive. Like, you can't, you can't respond to it as long as you're sending the right appropriate card. And then on top of that, you get to negate and have your opponent's monsters and play through their broken boards that they're setting up. A large part of current Yu-Gi-Oh! is setting up monsters that have big Solemn Judgment type effects. This card helps you play through that very, very effectively and resolve your cards into those effects. Okay, that's a very important card. Definitely, definitely sees play in almost, I want to say, every single deck in the format. So definitely be aware of this card if you're going to play modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Okay. Next card, next card, next card, next card, Pot of Prosperity. This card is one of a million different Pot of Whatever cards, but I think this is the most important one to note. This one has a lot of different effects on it, but I'm going to sum them up into, I think, four. I think there's four different effects. The first part is the cost. You have to banish three or six cards face down from your extra deck. That's the cost. Second part is the um, sort of restrictions. After the card resolves, your opponent only takes half damage for the rest of the turn. So if you're trying to OTK your opponent, this is a very, very difficult card to include in your deck. It doesn't make it easy to kill your opponent after this card resolves. You have to deal 16,000 damage, which even by modern Yu-Gi-Oh standards is very difficult to do in one turn. Additionally, you cannot draw cards by card effects the turn you activate this card. Prior to or after resolving this card, you cannot draw any cards outside of, you know, your draw for turn. This is a pretty big restriction. You can't use Pot of Prosperity to dig for something like Allure of Darkness and get a crazy engine going. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty big restriction on this card. And then, of course, you can only activate one of them per turn. But the effect is very powerful. For each of the cards you banish from your extra deck, either three or six, you get a look at the top three or six cards of your deck, and then you get to add one of those cards to your hand. That's an insanely powerful effect. Imagine now your opening hand is not five cards, it's now 11, and you get to pick from those top six, find the best card to help you get set up. It's one of the most powerful consistency cards in the game. 
It's very good for slower control decks. It's very, very good at providing consistency to decks that may be struggling. And a lot of different decks are going to play this card and be very happy about it. This is definitely a card you need to know when playing Modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Alright, next up. Next up. This is another very powerful spell card. Triple Tactics Talent. There are three cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! that are banned. One of them is called Pot of Greed. Mm. One of them is called Change of Heart. And the other one is called The Forceful Sentry. This card is all of those wrapped up into one card. Of course, it does have an activation restriction. It says if your opponent has activated a monster effect during your main phase this turn, activate one of these effects. Either draw two cards, Pot of Greed, take control of one monster your opponent controls until the end phase, Change of Heart, except little upside on Change of Heart, it doesn't target which is pretty important and comes up a lot. And then the third effect is look at your opponent's hand, choose one card from it, and shuffle it into the deck, Forceful Sentry. You can only use one per turn, so this is kind of a nice 40th card in your deck if you don't have a 40th card, or if you really need to force through a combo or can do a lot with two draws or disrupting your opponent's hand. This card's actually pretty great. This card's actually pretty great to include in your deck. It's a full three of. I think this is one of the best spell cards, if not the best spell card in the format. The power level is just so high, your opponent is going to be activating monster effects during your main phase. They are going to be interacting with you. If they don't, they're going to get OTK'd, they're going to get destroyed. The format is too powerful for opponents not to be interacting with monster effects in your main phase. There are ways to play around Triple Tactics Talent, but not many. Not many. This card is very devastating when it resolves, it gives an immediate advantage to the player who gets to use it. It's kind of a way of balancing these sort of unfair hand traps like Lancia, you know, Nibiru and stuff. Maybe you Nibiru my five monsters, but you know what? I get to take your Nibiru and then I can link with the token and the Nibiru and do something. Triple Tactics Talent's very powerful. It's very, very powerful. I think you need to know about this card. You need to know when your opponent is playing this card in order to play modern Yu-Gi-Oh to the fullest extent. Okay, next card is another limited card. The second limited card It's called By the Grave. This is a card you need to know about. This card says target one monster in your opponent's graveyard, banish it, and if you do, until the end of the next turn, its effects are negated, as well as the activated effects and effects on the field of monsters with the same original name. First thing to note that's important is it's a quick play. Second thing to note is that it uh, negates the effects from fucking everywhere. So, if you activate a hand trap, something like Ash Blossom and Joy of Spring, you pitch it to the graveyard for cost, your opponent can then chain called by the grave, target your Ash Blossom, Banish it and negate that Ash Blossom as well as every other Ash Blossom until the end of the next turn. This is important to note as well. If you are playing your own Ash Blossoms and you called by the grave your opponent's Ash Blossoms, you won't be able to use your Ash Blossoms on the next turn. Something to keep in mind. Something to keep in mind. Very powerful card. Very, very powerful card. Helps unfair decks play through hand traps. That's the biggest application. But it also helps you interrupt graveyard strategies, interrupt things like Branded in Red interrupt very common cards like Eldritch, the Golden Lord. It's a it's a solid card. It gives decks ways to interact with the graveyard in, in kind of a busted way. I would say definitely know about this card and honestly most likely include it in your deck if you are playing modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay, next up, next up, next up, next up. This card is, all right, this card is, it's hated. Let's be honest. People hate this card. It's called Mystic Mind. And I don't really understand why people hate this card. I mean, I, I come from formats that are older where cards like Royal Oppression and Gravity Bind are, you know, they're floodgates, right? But in older formats, I guess it's more common to include spell and trap hate into the deck that aren't monster-based. But with Mystic Mine, you know, sometimes a lot of decks nowadays are skimping on including spell and trap hate. So Mystic Mine can oftentimes just win a game one outright. The way this card works is if your opponent controls more monsters than you, your opponent cannot activate monster effects or declare an attack, and then vice versa. If you control more monsters than your opponent, you're the one who gets locked. And then during the end phase, if both players control the same number of monsters, this card gets destroyed. When you activate this card is pretty important. You have to activate it in certain circumstances where your opponent has more monsters. They can't like slim their monsters down to the same number as you. And it's also pretty important that you have a way to shut it off yourself in the main deck. A lot of decks are now maining out this card in the Draco back Rider from the Adventure cards. We'll get into that in a second. Um, but yeah, this is just an insane floodgate. This, this is a card that says, I win if you don't have spell and trap outs, basically. Or if you don't have a way to clear your own board, which is very rare. Most decks aren't playing that right now, outside of, of course, the Draco back. 
Um, so yeah, definitely a hated card. I don't know why it gets so much hate. I mean, I understand why it's a uh, why it can be frustrating if you just want to like play the game and spam your combo over and over and over again. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think this card is great. I think it's fantastic. You definitely need to know about it. You definitely need to be prepared for it if you're playing modern Yu-Gi-Oh. This card can come down and it can kill you out of nowhere. Okay, next card, next card, next card, next card. Dark Ruler No More. This card is a very interesting card. It's kind of an alternate to Forbidden Droplet in a sense that they both accomplish similar things. But when you actually want to use Dark Ruler No More versus when you actually want to use Forbidden Droplet is a very different circumstance. I think you do need to know about Dark Ruler No More. It helps when opponents are playing decks that just build a huge board and spend all their resources to do it. I think this card is very good in those applications. But I think it's much worse when opponents are relying on multiple different sources of interruptions, like Fairy Tale Snow, maybe more quick play spells like Forbidden Droplet, Cyframe Gamma, like stuff from the fucking hand, like Nibiru and stuff. Dark Ruler No More gets a little bit worse. Dark Ruler No More says negate the effects of all face-up monsters your opponent currently controls until the end of this turn. Also, for the rest of this turn after this card resolves, your opponent takes no damage. Neither player can activate monster effects in response to this card's activation. When you actually want this card is when you can establish a position that not only breaks your opponent's board, but makes it very difficult for your opponent to rebuild. I like this card a little bit in Drytron, because I feel like Drytron right now, with Vandy's Ruler and stuff, can set up positions where your opponent can't come back. I also like it a lot in Artifact Scythe decks, or decks that are looking to play more of a grindy game. I don't like this card so much in decks that are relying on OTKing opponents and can't really build resilient boards. I think this this card suffers a little bit there. I don't like this card so much in that it's not a quick play, like Forbidden Droplet, so worst case scenario, it can't actually be an interrupt in your opponent's play. It is largely just you let your opponent do your thing, and then you play Dark Ruler no more, and you try to break their board and set up your own. It's very um, single-use kind of thing, whereas I feel like Droplet has a little bit more application, a little bit more versatility. But they they do have uh, different upsides and downsides, and you got to pick the right card for your deck, and you definitely got to know about both of these cards when playing the game. Also, keep in mind, Dark Ruler no more can be responded to by spell cards and trap cards. Forbidden Droplet can give you that option to pitch a spell or trap card and play around being responded to by those cards okay next card next card another modal spell mimicking banned spells of the past lightning storm lightning storm is a very powerful card and you do need to know about it because you know when you know about it it makes it much easier to play around activate if you control no face-up cards that's the big thing you can't play this card if you control face-up cards that's the issue you can't play it if you're already set up so it only helps you come back it doesn't help you press advantages. Something to keep in mind. Activate one of these effects. Modal, destroy all attack position monsters your opponent controls. So, Mirror Force. And then Modal, destroy all spell and trap cards your opponent controls. Harpy's Feather Duster. You can only activate one Lightning Storm per turn. So, big restriction. You can only activate one Lightning Storm per turn. If your opponent has attack position monsters and back row, you're going to have to pick, if you've drawn two Lightning Storms, which one you want to clear and why. It's uh, also a reason why you see a lot of people summon monsters in defense position in current Yu-Gi-Oh! And you can also play around it by summoning your own monsters in defense position as well. I think this is a good card. I think it has applications going second. It has applications when decks are trying to set up multiple floodgates or set up, you know, just like big fat boards and you just want to like, you know, Mystic Mind, Lightning Storm, or not Mystic Mind, sorry, Dark Ruler No More, Lightning Storm. You can't Mystic Mind, Lightning Storm because... Lightning Storm says, if you control no face-up cards. Whew, this is a lot. This is a lot. This is a long video, but uh, yeah, Lightning Storm. Lightning Storm. You guys are getting through it. And honestly, 20 cards is not that much to learn, um, considering all the cards that have uh, been printed. But I think if you know these, if you know Lightning Storm, if you know these last 13, you're you're well on your way in order to being a competent and competitive modern Yu-Gi-Oh! player. Okay, number 14. Number 14 is Cosmic Cyclone. This one's a simple one. It's just pay 1,000 life points, banish a spell and trap on the field. Very simple, quick play. No bullshit, banish, answer. I love this card. I think it's very powerful. It's great against a lot of the spell and traps in the format that have effects when they get sent to the graveyard. I think this card is phenomenal. I think this card has a place in every single deck in the format. Well, I say deck, but I mean side deck usually. But you could honestly main this card in almost every single deck, and it wouldn't be terrible. This is the spiritual successor to Mystical Space Typhoon, and honestly, it's a great upgrade. It's not much, but it does the job, and it does exactly what you want. 
There's another card, which is number 15, Twin Twisters. This is the other card that's similar to Cosmic Cyclone. You discard one card, then you target up to two spell and traps on the field, destroy them. This card is very big, destroys two spells and traps, but it destroys them, A, so it puts them in the graveyard. Not as good as Cosmic Cyclone. B, costs a discard. If your deck can't really afford that discard, decks like, I think, Despia or... I don't know. Despia is the only one that comes to mind. Maybe Dragon Link or whatever. Those cards don't really love discarding. Oh, Dragon Link probably discards just fine. But um, maybe Eldritch or something. I don't know. There, there's uh, there's moments where you wouldn't want to play Twin Twisters over Cosmic Cyclone and vice versa. I think Twin Twisters does better in decks like Drytron, where discarding your monster doesn't matter, has the same effect in your hand and the grave. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Twin Twisters, know about it. Cosmic Cyclone, know about it. These two cards help you deal with your opponent's Mystic Minds. Your opponent's trap cards, their floodgates, their whatever, you get the idea. You get the idea. Okay, next card. Number 16. We're almost through the only 20 cards you really need to know to play modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Number 16 is Cross Out Designator. This card is very powerful. You declare one card name, banish one of that declared name from your main deck. If you do, negate its effects as well as the activated effects and effects on the field of cards with the same original name until the end of this turn. You can only use one crossout designator per turn. This card is nuts. First off, let's talk about the artwork because the artwork is fire. It brings back the classic nobleman art. Look at this, look at this bad boy. He's, he's staring you down. He's like, that card you just activated, negated. This is a solemn judgment, more or less, in mirror matches that you can activate from your hand. Pardon me, I just had to sneeze real quick. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, where were we? Where were we? Oh, yeah. Solemn Judgment. From your hand. Mm, very powerful. Very, very powerful. As long as you have the card in your main deck. This card is basically called by the grave against hand traps. Again, as long as you're playing that hand trap you want to negate. Like, let's say your deck loses to Nibiru. We'll just include a copy of Nibiru and some crossout designators, and all of a sudden you have three Solemn Judgments you can play from your hand to stop that Nibiru effect. Very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. This card's also strong because it's a uh, interrupt. You can set it on your opponent's turn, use it to interrupt things. Let's say you're playing in a mirror match. Your opponent activates their chaos space. You can use cross out designator, banish your chaos space from your deck. And then all of a sudden, all of their chaos space effects for the rest of the turn, both the graveyard effect and the hand effect are, I think, uh, negated. Yeah, and they can't use it, which is a huge, huge, awesome way to interrupt the opponent. It doesn't activate triple tactics talent because it is a spell card. It doesn't activate a few of the other stuff like Cyframe Gear Gamma because it is a spell card. Just a card that cannot be understated in mirror matches and in more homogenous metagames. This card is definitely a card you need to know about when playing modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay, 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 okay. Last four cards. Last four cards. We're getting we're getting down to it. We're getting down to it. We're getting down to it. Okay. The next card. The next card is infinite impermanence. You're going to notice a trend with the next three cards. They're all trap cards. They're all trap cards that you can play while breaking the rules of the game. Normally in Yu-Gi-Oh, trap cards have to be set in play before they can be activated for a full turn. These next three cards are trap cards that you can activate from your hand provided the requirements are met. They break all the rules of trap cards of the past, and thus become very, very powerful cards. This card says target one face of monster your opponent controls, negate its effect until the end of this turn. Then, if this card was set before activation, so not only can you use this card from your hand, we'll get to that in a second, but you can set this card, and it gives you upside for doing so. If this card was set before activation, and is on the field at resolution for the rest of this turn, all other spell and trap cards in this column are negated. For old school Yu-Gi-Oh players, you're like, call them, what the fuck? <laughs> but, you know, it matters in modern Yu-Gi-Oh where you set your spells and traps. You have to set in a way to play around infinite impermanence. This is something you constantly have to keep in mind when playing the game, where you want to set your, you know, floodgates and stuff like that, stuff you need to stick around and not be negated. If you control no cards, you can activate this card from your hand. So basically, turn one, it's a really really solid effect negation it's not hard once per turn which is great it's not even soft once per turn which is great you can draw multiples of these and they're amazing unfortunately you can't you know activate two of them in the same chain from your hand because you'll control the first one but it's still very very solid it doesn't get chain blocked very easily 
It's just a really, really great card. It's just a little low impact. That's the only issue with this card is that it's a little low impact, but it has a lot of applications and it's very, very versatile. If your deck can do a lot with a versatile response to certain things and doesn't have issues with, you know, making and playing through like lesser boards, then Infinite Impermanence is actually quite good. It's also very, very nice because it is a hand trap, literally a trap, doesn't trigger triple tactics talent, can't be stopped by Call by the Grave. It can be stopped by Crossout Designator, which plays kind of into the strengths of Crossout Designator, but at the same time, like you do play around two of the more prominent responses to hand traps in the format, which is Triple Tactics and Call by the Grave. So it's a it's a really solid card, and it's definitely a card you need to know about and have on your radar when getting into modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay, the next card, the next card on this list is Evenly Matched. Uh, where where is it? This card is very interesting. It's it's a sweeper, but not like anything we've ever really seen before. It says at the end of the battle phase, if your opponent controls more cards than you do, you can make your opponent banish cards from their field face down so they control the same number of cards as you do. If you control no cards, you can activate this card from your hand. So the issue with evenly matched is that you have to activate it at the end of the battle phase if you're activating it from your hand and getting the most value out of it. That's not... I don't want to say it's bad. I don't want to say it's like, uh, you know, whack or anything, but it is limiting. It is limiting. And it cuts you off from using your main phase one to its fullest extent and using your battle phase to its fullest extent. Usually you're going to want this card against decks like Eldritch, decks where you're going to play a slower, more grindy game where you can do stuff on later battle phases, not get, you know, all your shit shoved in and whatnot. It's a sweeper card. It's also good if you can establish positions that are hard for your opponent to come back from, specifically in decks like Tritron, where you summon a Vanity's Ruler or Vanity's... What is the guy called? Vanity something... Whatever, you get the idea. And you lock your opponent out of the game. If I can banish most of my opponent's board, summon the Vanity guy, and lock them out of the game, then I'm feeling pretty good about it. I'm feeling pretty good about it. It is a trap card you can use from your hand on your first turn of the game. You can't use it on your opponent's first turn of the game because they won't have a battle phase obviously, <laughs> uh, day one Yu-Gi-Oh stuff, but yeah, uh, definitely a card to keep on your radar, definitely a card to consider when building your deck, definitely a card to know about when playing post-war games, it's often side-decked, very rarely is it in the main deck, unlike a lot of these other cards we've talked about, it is it is very rarely in the main deck, but it is a, it is a powerful sideboard option, and it cannot be understated, the, the strength of this card, and being able to use it from your hand on the first turn of the game. Okay, and the last of these three cards I want to talk about is the Nether Limited card, Red Reboot. This card says when your opponent activates a trap card, negate the activation, and if you do, set that card face down. Then, they can set one other trap card directly from their deck. If you're just reading this, you're like, wow, that's, that's trash. <laughs> it's, it's a hard minus two. You just, or not minus two, but yeah, I guess it is minus two. You give your car, opponent a card and you lose a card. Why is this so good? It's terrible. But... Next part is where it gets really good. For the rest of this turn, after this card resolves, your opponent cannot activate trap cards. And then you can activate this card from your hand by paying half your life points. This card is nuts. This card is nuts. This card is akin to a card from old called Cold Wave, but it's a little bit more balanced than Cold Wave. It, first off, you know, requires your opponent to activate a trap card to respond to it. And um, it's bad if you can't OTK that turn. Very, very bad for you if you can't OTK that turn. Whereas Cold Wave locked people out the following turn. Red Reboot is only for that turn. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this card is an, is an OTK enabler. It's an FTK enabler against... Not FTK enabler, but... Um, you get you get what I'm saying. First turn, your first turn. Not their... They, they get, you, get, you get what I'm going with this. You get what I'm going with this. If your deck is very fast, if your deck is very powerful, this card helps you play through stuff like Eldritch. It's a, it's a very, very disgusting card. It's akin to cards like... Harpy's Feather Duster, you're going to see this in a lot of sideboards. It's very good against the Eldritch decks. It's very good against any decks that are playing trap cards. It helps you just play through anything, play through floodgates, play through whatever, and not have to worry about it. It's kind of like a call by the grave, but for back row, more or less. That's how I'd describe it. It's only good if you're OTKing, realistically, but you know what? Most of the time you're OTKing, so that's it's a, it's a great card. Great card. Definitely need to know about it. And then the last card I want to include on this is not necessarily a card you want to know about, but it is a cool card that I think sees not enough play. And this card is Ice Dragon's Prison. This card is the only trap card that can't be activated from the hand that I'm including on this top 20 list. I guess 
top 20 list. It's not really a top 20. It's, it's, it's like literally only 20. These are the only 20 cards I think you really need to know. And then we'll get into the 15 archetypes right after this. But Ice Dragon's Prison. This guy. This bad boy. This is a really powerful trap. It says, target one monster in your opponent's graveyard. Special summon it to your field, but its effects are negated. Then, you can banish one monster from both players' fields that have the same type as each other. So, let's say your opponent has a dragon monster in their grave. They summon a dragon monster into play. You activate this. You special summon the monster from their graveyard. Banish that monster and your opponent's monster. And all of a sudden... You got a DD Crow and a free banish. It's just a powerful card. It's just a really, really powerful card. You can only use one per turn, but it's just an insane trap card. Insane trap card. Definitely worth mentioning. There are a few honorable mentions that I wanted to put on this list, like Solemn Strike and There Can Be Only One, but those cards, uh, I think they're similar enough to old cards like Rivalry of Warlords and Solemn Judgment that you can figure out when you see them for the first time. You don't really need to know about them in order to play the game. You can play the game and run into them and be like, oh, okay, I know what's up. You know what I mean? You can, you can kind of figure those cards out in the moment. These are 20 cards that I think are very different from anything we've seen in past Yu-Gi-Oh. Not incredibly different, like obviously Cosmic Sight Lagoon isn't like, you know, just an insane left field version of MST or anything, but I think that these are these are 20 cards you do need to know about in order to play modern Yu-Gi-Oh successfully, and I think these are the only 20 cards you really need to know about in order to play modern Yu-Gi-Oh successfully. Okay, let's get into the archetypes because this is where things get a little bit more complicated. Not too much more complicated though. I'm going to do these in order. So I'm going to do these from the most important ones to know down to the least important ones to know. So if you are going to learn them, you can learn them in this order and honestly probably be fine after the first like four or five. <laughs> the first one you want to know about is Despia. So we'll put we'll put Despia, uh, we'll put Alien Bear. Despia is a fusion monster center deck. I'm going to give you a brief overview of each of these archetypes, what they do, what they're looking to do. This deck is very resilient to removal. It puts up a lot of interrupts. It doesn't put up a lot of negates, but it can, you know, fuse off with your monsters using Falling of Albaz and using Super Polymerization. Gotta be aware of that. It's just a fusion deck, so keep in mind what the fusion monsters do. Once you learn this archetype, you'll have a pretty good understanding of what you're doing against, you know, most modern Yu-Gi-Oh! because this is the most popular and most powerful deck right now. There's a lot that goes into this deck. I'm not going to go in and describe all of it, but each of the Despia monsters has two effects, something to keep in mind, and, you know, they're all very good. All of the cards are very good. Okay, next deck that you need to know about is Sword Soul. Uh, Sword Soul is a synchro deck. So unlike uh, Despia, which is a fusion deck, Sword Soul is a synchro deck. It's largely worm-type monsters, which is a new type. If you're an old-school player like myself, you've probably never seen a worm-type monster before. This card is um, the Sword Soul of Moyi. This is the most common starter. It basically summons a token, and then you synchro with the token, and you draw a card. So it's like a free plus however many. The synchros also draw you cards. The synchros also have other effects, which are very, very, very powerful. And this deck is very, very fast. It can OTK you and kill you out of nowhere if you let them resolve even one of their effects. It's also very consistent. There's a lot of ways to find your starters, like Moyi, between the Sacred Summit and the Emergence and the whatever cards that search for these. You, you get the idea. You want to know what this deck does. It's a Synchro deck. The previous deck, uh, uh, Despia, is a Fusion deck. Basic strategies. Basic strategies. Okay, next strategy is Eldlich. Eldlich is a very, very, very powerful trap card-based deck. This deck is usually playing upwards of 20 to 30 trap cards. Sometimes it plays less, depending on if it's a combo variant or not. But it's built around this guy right here, Eldlich the Golden Lord. He's the main boss monster in the deck. They can summon him out very easily. He has a lot of different effects. It's important to note all of these. It's important to learn all the different trap cards that surround him, which are like the Eldlixer and the Golden Land cards are, you know, they're important to know. They all have different effects. But that's how this deck works. It's us usually looking to activate trap cards. Cards like Red Reboot, cards like Cosmic Cyclone, Lightning Storm, these cards are very good against Eldlich because their turn ones aren't going to be summon a big board. They're usually going to be like set four trap cards, maybe activate Floodgate or something like that. Definitely want to um, definitely want to keep in mind the Eldlich deck when uh, building your deck and building your sideboard. Okay, these are probably the three most common decks. I'm going to be honest. I think Eldlich is very common because it's very affordable. It's not a deck where you really need it. Uh, prominent extra deck to build it. All of the cards come in very affordable rarities. You can play uh, budget versions of cards like Pot of Prosperity in Pot of Extravagance. You can do a lot of different stuff. So this card's, this deck's going to be very popular at a local level. I think Sword Soul and 
Despia are also going to be very popular just because they are the best decks by a wide margin. The next deck, which is also very, very popular, is Floanderese. This is a deck you need to know about just because it's like a it's like an anti-meta deck. I would I would compare this to like in the past macro cosmos decks. This deck can also even play macro cosmos and dimensional fissure. It's basically trying to stun the opponent out. It's a normal summon heavy deck. They normal summon all of their monsters. They don't special summon. This card is their boss monster. He locks out special summon effects of attack position monsters, which means, you know, if you're link summoning, your link monsters get no effects because they can't be in defense position. And they have a lot of different ways to like normal summon on your turn and lock you out with floodgate monsters like barrier statue or, you know, a apex avian, that kind of stuff, that kind of stuff. Definitely a deck you need to know about. Now the fifth deck I want to talk about is not actually a deck. It is the adventure package. This is very, very, very common. This is very, very common. It's played in almost every single deck to some capacity right now. It's also sometimes not played so much at a local level because the entire package itself is like $500 and it's like 10 cards. So mm, you might see it more at like a regional or a YCS level, but it's a very powerful card and not just card, but a fucking whole archetype thing. There are decks that are built around it, basically. You'll see Sword Soul decks with it. You'll see Despia decks with it. You'll see Eldritch decks with it, honestly. I don't think you'll see Floanderese decks with it because you need your normal summon effects, and it's a it's a pretty big uh, dissonance because the adventure stuff cuts you off from using your normal summon monster effects. But yeah, um, this is a very powerful engine. It gives you the Draco back, which I mentioned earlier. It's a main deck spell out to Mystic Mine, which is huge. If your deck loses to Mystic Mine, then definitely consider the adventure package. It is honestly worth the $500 if you're going to a YCS and you need it for your deck because it makes your deck that much better, that much more resilient to random bullshit like Rivalry of Warlords or Mystic Mine or main deck summon limit, crazy shit like that. It just makes you very resilient. These are the these are the top five, I would say, things you need to know about in order to play modern Yu-Gi-Oh! But the next five are also pretty common, so you're probably going to want to know about them too. But if you're just learning five for now, I think these are a good five to learn. These are a good five decks that if you know these five decks you'll probably be fairly successful at modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay, next, next up, next five, Prank Kids, Prank Kids. So this deck has fallen off a little bit, I think, because uh, the top deck, Despia, fucking destroys it. It's like an unlosable matchup for Despia. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a great matchup. I mean, Prank Kids is still a very powerful deck. It's a fusion deck with a lot of really annoying cards that like, generate little advantage that slowly add up and then you're just like all of a sudden looking at your field of 10 cards and your hand of five cards and you have like three hand traps and like one or two little interrupts that are it's just a very annoying deck they can put a lot of advantage and steamroll that advantage like sort of snowball it i guess not steamroll it uh snowball advantage yeah it snowballs advantage a lot it's a very very powerful deck at doing that it's very resilient to things that aren't banishing the monsters because i think your monsters protect from destruction it recently got hit this uh, Meow Meow got hit on the last ban list, but um, it's still a very, very strong, very, very strong deck. And it can still take over uh, any one of these decks except perhaps Despia. I think if you're planning on playing Despia, this this deck is a non, non-issue. non You just <laughs> you just activate the fusion monster and win the game. <laughs> okay, next deck you need to know about is Drytron. This deck is impossible to kill. It's been hit on every ban list since the you know beginning of last year and whatnot and it's still just around kicking it just plays the next best thing and the engine is still just fucking insane as long as they have ben 10 they can keep going it's a ritual deck so it's important to note that this is a ritual deck if they need to they can summon big ritual monsters like drytron meteor and straconids they don't even need the extra deck to kill you with they can amass large advantage through each one of the drytron monsters effects if you've played during Dragon Rulers format, I would compare this to the Dragon Rulers deck. It's very, very similar. Each one of the monsters has two different effects. It has the advantage gain effect, and it has the way to summon it from the field, or not field, from the hand or the graveyard. Similar to all the Dragon Rulers. Uh, they're just a little weaker, but they have, I, I don't know, they just have more power to them, I feel like, because this deck can kill you with one card in hand. This deck can kill you with, it's just fucking insane. This deck is, is disgusting. It's very, very, very threatening. And they can put up very, very annoying cards like Vanity's... Is it Vanity's Ruler? Yeah, it is Vanity's Ruler. Okay, Vanity's Ruler is one of the cards that the Drytron deck can put up very consistently on turn one under Nibiru. And 
force you to basically have Droplet or Dark Ruler no more or Forbidden Chalice or something in order to even play the game. The deck is very scary. Very, very scary. It's a deck I never want to play against, but every time I play it, it just like falls apart to a hand trap. <laughs> so it's kind of one of those weird decks where it's like weirdly resilient to some things, but weirdly not resilient to other things. Definitely consider that when picking up the deck. It's a pretty affordable deck. You can build it in a budget sort of sense for less than some of the other decks in the format that I think are quite expensive, like Despia or Sword Soul with the Brave packages. Um, but it is it is a strong deck. It is a strong deck if it's something you're, you're interested in playing, and it can definitely contend with, I think, every single one of these top decks, uh, except maybe Flow Andres gives it a little bit of trouble. Maybe not. Maybe it's actually all right. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Okay, next deck that you need to know about is Dragon Link. This is another deck that has been hit by every single ban list and is still, honestly, in my opinion, very slept on. Very, very slept on. I actually would say that this deck is on par with like the Sword Soul decks in terms of like raw power level and ability to play through certain things. I just think that this deck struggles a lot with Despia. Uh, and that's kind of the issue with it right now is that if you can't beat the best deck in the format, if you don't have a great matchup against the best deck in the format, you're going to fall to the wayside a little bit. But this is one of, if not the most fun deck in modern Yu-Gi-Oh to play next to Despia, of course. It has a million different lines of play. You get to play some of the most fun cards in the game like chaos ruler which is a synchro monster dragon link is ultimately a link deck but where is it chaos ruler there he is it's ultimately a link deck but you also do summon really cool synchro monsters like chaos ruler chaos ruler is awesome when you summon him you get a mill five cards you get to add a light or dark monster to your hand it's just like a very fun card it makes sure that like all of the games that you're playing are very different you're constantly thinking constantly using your brain constantly creating fun new combos on the fly using the dragon link monsters and they all have like just just cool cool effects very very cool effects this is a fun deck it's a very fun deck if you're looking for a fun deck to play i'd recommend dragon link you'll never have a bad time playing unless you're playing against like flow entries or despia okay maybe you'll have a bad time playing it but if you find a build maybe with the brave stuff maybe figure something out where you can do all right against despia i think it's a, i think it's a strong deck i think it's a strong deck for sure okay the next decks that you need to know about these decks they don't see a lot of play, but the people who play them will never not play them. <laughs> uh, Tribrigade, 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 I can't say this word. I can't say it. I can't say it. This deck is like a, it's like a very fair, like, Link deck where you just, um, you just activate your dude's effects, you summon a Link monster or two, you put up an interrupt or two, you hope that's good enough, <laughs> pretty much. The engine is really strong. And it got a new boost in the starter deck from the Albez starter deck. It has the Mercurier, which is a new Tribrigade monster. If it's uh, banished, I think you can you can do something cool with it. If you control something, you can do... I don't know. I don't know why this card helps the deck. It, I, I guess it does. Anyway, all the monsters are Winged Beast, Beast, or Beast Warrior. They all have synergies with those types of things. This deck struggles a little bit with Rivalry of Warlords. It struggles a little bit with a few other cards like Artifact Lancia because they do need to banish stuff. This deck actually struggles a lot with almost everything. You're going to have trouble playing through almost anything. <laughs> I don't think it has any really great matchups, but it also, on the other side of things, doesn't have any really bad matchups either. It's a mid-range deck, so if you want to play sort of a more fair deck, I think Tri Brigade is a pretty good deck. I think it's a pretty solid deck in today's metagame. It has some, some cool combos for sure. It definitely can do some fun stuff. It gets to play the card Rescue Cat. Even though Rescue Cat is eroded, it's still pretty good in the Tri Brigade deck. It's, it's fun. It's a fun deck. Definitely look into it if that's your type of thing. Okay, the next deck is Invoked. I think the Invoked deck is another one of those, you know, like Dragon Link and Triton decks. Impossible to kill. This deck will always be around. It will always be around because Summon Alistair will always be a strong effect. This deck is another Fusion deck. It's very similar to the Despia deck, but I think it's slightly worse than Despia deck. You can play them together, but there's awkwardness in the engines. Alistair does not want to be played with the Brave stuff because you do want to normal summon your Alistair and get the effect. So it has like this weird like conflict with some of the other stuff you'd rather be playing in the Despia deck. It also conflicts in that if you draw Alistair and Alubear, which are both normal summon starters, you only get to pick one of them to normal summon and start, and the other one kind of just rots in your hand awkwardly. So I think there's some issue with playing both of them together. I think it is very powerful to play both of them together. Branded Fusion is a an insane card. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but um, you'll see this deck. You'll see it. They summon this fusion monster called Makava, I think it's called. Yeah. And this guy's just a... Uh, he's like um, like a Heraclinos, but he's only once per turn, uh, pretty much. He can also negate monster effects, which is good. But yeah, it's a fusion deck. Fusion deck. 
Uh, next card, next card, not card, sorry, next uh, archetype is Sky Striker. Sky Striker is beloved by a bunch of um, people who I won't say anything about in this video uh, uh, for risk of, of offending large large groups of people, but uh, yeah, people like this deck for reasons. <laughs> it's, it's not a good deck, I don't think it's a good deck at all, but it is a spell-based combo deck. You're going to be playing a lot of spells in this deck, like 20 to 30 spells. All of your monsters are link monsters, so you link off into your monsters and they kind of cycle through each other, and then they get effects based off of like the spells in your graveyard and whatnot. A lot of the spells that are powerful in this deck are limited, like Engage, Hornet Drones, and Multi-Roll, but you do get a lot of really interesting, unique effects in this deck, like Widow Anchor, which is kind of a crazy card. It's a quick play spell, it says if you control no monsters in your main monster zone, you can negate a monster effect, but if you have three or more spell cards in your graveyard, you can also take control of the monster. So it's like a quick play um, enemy controller, but you don't have to tribute. It's a cool card and it's tutorable and reusable using some of these other cards. It's a cool deck. It's a cool deck, all things considered. I don't think it's a very good deck, but it is a cool deck. Okay, next deck that you need to know about. The, the only reason you need to know about Sky Striker is because people will play this deck just because they're fascinated with the artwork on the cards. And there will be Sky Striker players at any given tournament just, just for that reason alone. Okay. Next, next deck you need to know about is Phantom Knights. This is a funny deck because everyone's always like, Phantom Knights is the best deck at the beginning of every meta, but um, but it's usually not. <laughs> it's usually not. It's a rank 3, level 3 access deck that likes to summon these 3 star monsters. All of the monsters have crazy powerful effects, but they're all a little underwhelming ultimately, and it's a board building deck that mm, has a little bit of trouble in today's metagame. I think it struggles with Scythe a lot, it struggles with Lancia a lot, it struggles with Nibiru, it struggles with like, honestly, all of this shit. It's it's one of those decks where like, on paper, this should be one of the best decks. It has very powerful follow-up, it can build boards very easily with only one or two cards, but it's not. It's just not. You have to play a lot of these like, weird, like, little Garnet cards, like Fogblade, which is a terrible draw. You have to add a bunch of like, these weird, random, like, level 3 monsters to your deck. You can't add like these versatile response cards like Fairy Tail Snow or Infinite Impermanence super easily into your deck. And for that reason, it's it's a really powerful engine that is bogged down by the fact that you have to play large amounts of the engine for it to be really good. Also, drawing certain combinations of the, the cards is is really awkward, which I don't love. The next deck is Virtual World. This is a deck that well, we're getting into the last three. I think these these don't see as much play, but uh, they do see some play, so they're important to note about. I think Virtual World is a bad deck, personally. I think it's a, it's a little too slow. It's a cool deck. It has a lot of potential if you can get into the grind game or the late game. And it does have a lot of OTK potential. But I think Desires to, one, nerf this deck a lot. I think there's a few other things that kind of give this deck a little bit of trouble. It does have a cool little um, hybrid build with the Sword Soul cards. I think that build's actually quite good. I think the hybrid Virtual World Sword Soul deck is, is really solid. But I think the Virtual World deck on its own is a little underpowered, but you will see it. You will see it, especially at a local level, because honestly, right now, decks are so expensive. If people own them, uh, they're probably going to keep playing them, even if they are a little underpowered. The next deck I want to talk about is Heroes, and to some degree, let's just type in Stratos, that's the that's the hero. Um, yeah, and to some degree, B Trooper is a very similar deck as well, and these are the last two decks I want to talk about. These are both decks that they can put up a lot of monsters and OTK you very easily, but they can't put up a lot of interrupts or negations or that kind of thing. They can usually put up maybe one interrupt in Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer, which I'll get into in the bonus section of the video. Whoa, did you guys think? Did you guys think there was going to be a bonus section? Oh, oh, there is a bonus section. We're going to get into that in a second here after I'm done talking about these last two archetypes. Yeah, they're just OTK decks, basically. They do nothing, they hope to survive until they get a battle phase, and then they kill you. That's, that's how these decks work. They're important to know about. They're very common at a local level. They're also pretty solid decks to bring to a YCS if you just want to have a good time and try to cheese a bunch of people with OTKs. I think these are very slept on decks, both of these two. And I think they have a lot of potential, a lot of different builds that are underexplored in the current metagame. I also think both of these decks do fairly well against Despia, which is, you know, kind of a kind of a cool little, little cyclical thing we have in the meta here. They might not be the most popular decks because they can't deal with some of these other decks so effectively, but they're actually pretty strong against the, the top two decks, I would say. Okay, bonus section. You guys weren't ready. You guys weren't ready for this. You guys thought 35 things, I only got to learn 35 things. You were wrong. 
you were wrong. We got to cover some extra deck monsters too. Bonus section. Extra deck monsters you need to know to play modern. Yu-Gi-Oh. The first one, Predaplant, Verte, Anaconda. You know what? This is just this is just the truth. This is just the truth. This little guy right here, I didn't even know about his first effect until the other day. <laughs> he can make a monster your opponent controls dark. That's why he's broken. No, I'm kidding. He's broken because he copies any fusion spell from your deck or polymerization, normal or quick play spell from your deck for the cost of 2,000 life points and the restriction that you cannot special summon monsters for the rest of this turn. That's, that's a small price to pay because you usually just end on this guy, send any fusion spell from your deck, usually like a branded fusion or a shade all fusion or a super polymerization or a red eyes fusion or a fusion desk you could do anything you could do anything with this card and it's generic it's very easy to summon this two effect monsters to link summon it if you don't know what link monsters are they're basically synchro monsters or fusion monsters but you just send two monsters from your field to the graveyard face up monsters that meet the requirements that's how it works yeah, that's just basically it. You summon it to the extra monster zone or to a zone where a red arrow is pointing to off another link monster. That's how it works. Mm. The next extra deck monster you need to know about is IP Mascarena. This card is very good. It's kind of like a formula synchron. It lets you link summon on your opponent's turn. It's very cool because if you link summon with this card, the monster you summon cannot be destroyed by card effects. Very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. All right, next card. Next card you need to know about the whole Charmer series. So there's a Charmer series in this um, current format. Hold up, I gotta sneeze one more time. All right, my bad, I'm back. I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Okay, yeah, there's a Charmer series that are, um, oh shit, it's hitting me again, it's hitting me again. All right, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Charmer series. You get the idea. You guys have seen the original Charmer cards, like these guys. They take control of a dark monster your opponent controls. This takes it to another level. This guy, um, well, this whole series, they take the attribute that they correspond with from your opponent's graveyard, special summon it to a zone this card points to. The card is, the zones it points to are the ones that the red arrows point to. So if you summon this in a main monster zone, you can't actually use its effect to steal a card because it's pointing to your spell and trap zones, <laughs> awkwardly enough. Okay, yeah, but... um. The other effect on these is that if it's destroyed by battle or a card effect, you get to search a monster of this attribute from your deck with a certain defense restriction or something. These cards are good. These cards are really, really good. I think they're all very slept on. The most common one, obviously, is the dark one, because dark monsters in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! have been the popular Yu-Gi-Oh! monsters to go to forever. But we've seen metagames where the wind one, the light one, they've all been like meta inclusions in the deck. So definitely a good cycle to know about when playing modern Yu-Gi-Oh! The next card I want to talk about is Halki Fibrax. This guy has a lot of different effects. The first one is you summon a tuner, level 3 or lower, from your deck in defense position when he's summoned, but it cannot activate its effects this turn. And then during your opponent's main phase or battle phase, you can special summon a tuner synchro monster. That comes up sometimes, but it's usually just to ladder up. He's a link 2, he takes a tuner to summon him, and then you get a special summon another tuner from your deck. So it's a link 2 that puts you automatically into a link 3. It includes a very powerful combo with Deskbot 001, and there's a bunch of other ways to use this card to get into... One of the next cards that I'm going to talk about on this list, Nightmare Unicorn. This guy is insane. This card is like, when I first read this card, I was like, what the fuck? This is crazy. It takes two plus monsters with different names. So you can make it with a Link 2 and a regular monster, or you can make it with two Link 2s or whatever. It, you can make it as long as they have different names. If it's Link Summoned, you can discard one card, then target one card on the field, shuffle it into the deck. Very powerful effect. Very, very powerful effect. It answers anything. You can make it on your opponent's turn with IP Mascarena. You can make it with any monsters, so you can use it in any extra deck, provided you want to link someone with your deck. And it's just really strong. But then on top of it, if it was co-linked when you activate that effect, you get a draw card. And during your normal draw phase, for each nightmare monster on the field that are co-linked, you get to draw an additional card every turn. So this card is just, it's just Cascade's advantage. It Cascade's advantage. If you can ever set up that position with the nightmare cards, it is very, very disgusting. It lets you draw multiple cards every turn. It lets you crush your opponent every turn past the first. Just a very, very busted card by all means. If you're just using it for the first effect, it's still very good. But the fact that it has all these extra effects that let you draw multiple cards is like, it's just so nice. Really, really powerful card. Definitely a card you need to know about. The next card is Access Code Talker. This is the OTK link monster 
in almost every single deck. The other one is Boral Sword Dragon, but this one's the most common one you need to know about. He banishes Link Monsters from your graveyard to pop uh, cards on the field untargeted. His effects can't be responded to. He gains attack points if you summon him using a Link Monster as material. He's usually somewhere in the ballpark of 4,300 to 5,300 attack, and he pops like multiple cards on your opponent's side of the field when he comes out. So this is like, I would say if you played Edison format at all, this is kind of like the Bryonic of the format where Access Code Talker is, he's not lethal on his own, but once your opponent gets to a certain point, this card is on the table for you to go for lethal. That's kind of like what, what I would compare it to is Bryonic of Edison format, more or less. Um, and then the last Link monster I think you need to know about is Appaloosa, Bow of the Goddess. This card is like a, it's like a shitty Light and Darkness Dragon. I think this card's fallen a lot out of favor. You don't honestly need to know about it. It's not as common as it used to be. It's not as good as it used to be because chain blocking is so prevalent and usually just summoning a fucking 2400 Appaloosa is not good enough to prevent your opponent from going off. It's good against some of the unfair decks. It's like an FTK against Drytron, but um, other than that, it's not really... It's not really worth knowing about. It, it just negates monster effects by losing attack. It's kind of like Light and Darkest Dragon, but it's optional, and you can summon it using however many, and you get however many for however many, and you, you get the idea. You get the idea. It's not, it's not as common as the other ones. All right, next cards you need to know about are Synchro Monsters. These are the more generic Synchro Monsters, but they're played in a wide variety of strategies. Herald of the Arclight is one of them. This guy's very busted. If it's sent to the graveyard, you can add a Ritual Spell or Ritual Monster. That includes if it's sent to the graveyard from the extra deck, so you can do some pretty busted stuff like, you know, Foolish This using um, Herald of the, or Diviner of the Herald, sorry. And then um, search your search your Ritual guys and get going. And that can search for either the Drytron stuff or can search for the other guy who's really popular, Illusion of Chaos. There's, there's, a, there's a wide variety of uses for this card. Makes it very, very powerful. Um, the other effect it has is you contribute it to Omni Negate. And it also has a cool little Macrocosmos effect if it's on the field too. The issue with this card being an Omni Negate is that it's really weak statted, so you don't want to summon it too often. You only summon it if your combo line needs like a little extra Omni Negate, and it can easily go into this card. But uh, usually, usually this card isn't summoned. It's usually just sent off an effect, like an AD or Servant or whatnot. Okay, the next Synchro Monster you need to know about that's generic is Borolode Savage Dragon. This is kind of just like your generic, like huge boss monster. This is like the Stardust Dragon of the format. When he's summoned, you can equip a Link Monster to him. He gets counters for each uh, rank of the Link Monster, and then you can negate cards um, by removing a counter from him once per turn. He's very, very strong. He gains the attack points of the Link Monster he is equipped to. Actually, he gains half the attack points, yeah. Um, and you can make him in just about any deck that likes to Link Summon. So, yeah, definitely a card you want to know about. This card is going to see more play in the new Blackwing deck. It sees a lot of play in the uh, Rocket deck, the Rocket Dragon Link deck, and it's just a very very strong card very very strong card that you need to know about okay next card that you need to know about that's a synchro is baron de fleur this card is a generic level 10 synchro and it's fucking busted it has a once per turn you can target any card on the field and destroy it effect that effect alone is nuts first off just pop anything once per turn and then once while it's face up on the field you can uh omni negate something and destroy it it's pretty solid because you can, you know, like flip it face down with stuff like Fairy Tale Snow. You can blink it out using its own effect, which is uh, during your standby phase, you can return it to the extra deck and summon a level nine or lower monster in your graveyard and then resummon it. So you can you can find a lot of ways to reuse that Solemn Judgment effect by, you know, resetting this somehow. It is important to note that you can't just summon uh, two Baron de Fleurs and use those negate effects because uh, you can only use the Solemn Judgment once while it's face up on the field, and that specific effect of cards named Baron de Fleur once per turn. So it is it is kind of a, not a card you want to summon more than one of, which is good because if it was, it would be insanely expensive, even more so than now. It's like $120, which is ridiculous um, for, for a card like this to, to cost. Kind of crazy. Okay, that's it for the Synchro Monsters I think you need to know about. And then for the Fusion Monsters, uh, the big ones that I think you need to know about are Millennium Eyes Restrict, this guy comes up off of Instant Fusion. He's like an extra copy of Called by the Grave, but he can also like suck up monsters and negate them on the field. Definitely want to look over this card. He's used in decks like Drytron, where you can utilize the level 1 body to make Moveda Th Fafnir or whatever, or, you know, just want to make a Link Karibo later on after you've you've gotten your value out of the Millennium Eyes Restrict. Uh, solid card. Solid card. Definitely something you want to know about. Elder Entity, NTS. This card is another card you want to know about. 
you very, very rarely fusion summon this card. Usually it's just sent from the extra deck to the graveyard to pop a card on the field using cards like Dogmatica Punishment or Herald, Diviner of the Herald, that kind of thing. Um, what's next? What's next? Oh, Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer. This is a big one. This is one you definitely want to know about. He's fallen a lot out of favor with the popularity of Despia and Super Polymerization because uh, he doesn't do that well against Super Polymerization. But this guy's nasty. So if, if he's destroyed... Uh, you get to activate this effect where you can special summon a Destiny Hero monster from your graveyard during the next standby phase. That includes himself. So if he's ever destroyed, you can just bring him back the next standby phase. He shrinks your opponent's monsters, which comes up a lot, actually helps you get over bigger threats. He also has this other effect, which is once per turn, you can destroy a card you control and another card on the field. That's very broken. Keep in mind that he can special summon himself back if he's destroyed by his own effect. So you can just get this once per turn pop effect. It's very difficult for some decks to deal with. I think Dragon Link has a lot of trouble dealing with this. I think the Prank Kids deck has a little bit of trouble dealing with this. There are a few other decks that don't really like to face down Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer still outside of the obvious, like, um, you know, Despia doesn't give a shit about this card, but uh, I think in general, this card is still really solid. Definitely slept on a little bit. It's a little bit out of favor just because of Despia, but... You know what? It, it's still a great card, and you definitely still need to know about it because it's going to be summoned against you a lot, more or less. It's one of the premier cards that Preta Plant, Verte, Anaconda summons out. One of the cool things about this card, too, is that the fusion materials for it are usually very powerful. You usually either send Destiny Hero Plasma or Destiny Hero Dasher for the level 6 or higher monster, and then you send this Destiny Hero, Destiny Hero Celestial, which is something you want to know about, um, definitely. He gives you a free draw two if you banish him plus another Destiny Hero monster in your graveyard. If you have like I think no cards in your hand, yeah. So it's like a it's like a really powerful effect, <laughs> and you get to send him to the grave for free off of the Predator Plant plus Fusion Destiny combo. Definitely, definitely a card to know about. And then the last two cards in this video, the last two cards in this video, Starving Venom Fusion Dragon. You got to know about this bad boy. I mean, in general, you got to know about your your fusion polymerization targets your super polymerization targets but this is one of the most common ones he takes any two dark monsters on the field so you can super poly two of your opponent's dark monsters very common if they went let's say predator plant into destroyer phoenix enforcer that's two dark monsters super poly immediately live take this guy he has three insane effects the first one is he gains attack equal to a special summon monster until the end of the turn which makes him huge the second effect is he can copy a level five or higher monsters effect and name that your opponent controls very insane, just copy their Baron, pop their board, negate their shit. Very disgusting. And then if he's destroyed, he destroys all your opponent's special summon monsters. So this guy is like the ultimate like fuck you to special summon decks or decks that are building big boards that also summon multiple darks. And then the last monster on this list is the Divine Arsenal. <sighs> Double A Zeus Sky Thunder. This guy is nasty. He takes two level 12 monsters, but... You're never doing that. You're never doing that. If an Xyz monster you control battled, you can summon Zeus on top of it. And then quick effect, not once per turn, you can detach two materials from this card, send all other cards from the field to the graveyard. And you can do that. Oh my god, this guy is insane. He's the only Xyz monster I think you really need to know about in order to play modern Yu-Gi-Oh! But he is the Xyz monster. He's in... If you're... Okay. If your deck has Xyz monsters, this guy... Is going to be in the deck yes there are decks that play like these cards in the near future like totally awesome which is going to make zeus very busted definitely keep in mind totally awesome is going to be going to be popping in the near future but as of right now the only xyz monster you really need to know about is the sky thunder double a zeus this guy's nasty he's like ah how do i say it how do i say it he's like a judgment dragon that doesn't actually destroy the cards he sends them which is huge because it gets around all the destruction effects and then uh or anti-destruction effects and then you can do it multiple times, you can do it as long as he has Xyz, uh, Xyz materials, and then on top of that, once per turn, if another card you control is destroyed by battle or an opponent's card effect, you can attach cards to him from your deck or extra deck or your hand to materials, so you can load him up. If you want to summon him before you start like going off with your further combos, like let's say you summon him and then you want to go off with some more virtual world stuff and then your opponent gammas them, then you can attach more material to him and you load up your Sky Thunder and that kind of stuff. It, it's like... Oh, this guy's just nuts. This guy's just very, very good. Huge stats, great attribute, great everything, very easy to summon, very powerful effect, not limiting, gives you a lot of play against a lot of different decks. Definitely got to know about this. And these are the cards. These are the cards and archetypes I think you need to know to play modern Yu-Gi-Oh! and be very successful. 
I think if you know these 20 cards up here, these 15 extra deck monsters, and these 15 archetypes relatively well, you could win a regional straight up. You don't need to know much more than this, which is crazy. It's crazy to think that like it's gone this far and still the best cards still dominate things. There's still only 40 cards in people's decks and they're not going to choose to include weaker cards because why would they? Why would they want to include something that's not in one of the more powerful cards in the game? I hope this video helped you guys. I hope that you guys learned something watching this. I hope it helped you get a little bit more accustomed to modern Yu-Gi-Oh and that kind of stuff if this is something you're looking to play more in the future. Hope to see you in the FL Discord or the EdisonFormat.com Discords in the description below. Make sure and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and leave a like. I love reading the comments too. Leave a comment if there's something I'm forgetting. I'm sure there's a million other cards you guys are going to say in the comments that are like... <laughs> Yo, I can't believe you didn't put fucking Condemned Witch or some crazy card. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm just making a, <laughs> making a video. I think, I think if you know these cards, you're gonna, you're gonna be pretty successful. Anyway, E3 Yu-Gi-Oh signing off. Peace out, everyone.